tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute, CRI, and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's May 2023, and this is episode 340, which is a spoiler-filled conversation about season one of the hit HBO TV series, The Last of Us, which is also based on the video game by the same name, The Last of Us. On this episode, I'm joined by Cole Burgett, who is a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary and the Moody Bible Institute. Cole teaches classes for high school and college students in Bible exposition and systematic theology. He also writes extensively about theology and popular culture. Cole has written an in-depth TV series review of HBO's The Last of Us, and his review is called Finding Family Among The Last of Us. And you can read it for free at our website, Equip.org. Cole, it's good to have you on again. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. As I mentioned, we're talking about the new hit HBO series, The Last of Us, which is actually based on a video game called The Last of Us. And so definitely wanted to talk to Cole because not only has he seen the series, but he's also played the video game, The Last of Us. So Tell our listeners a little bit about The Last of Us and what is the game and the series about? Yeah, so The uh, the Last of Us originally came out back in uh, 2013, I think it was, uh, developed by Naughty Dog. Naughty Dog is a uh, sort of a, a now a well-known developer of uh, what they call AAA video games or uh, sort of big budget uh, Hollywood level production value video games. They also did the um, the Uncharted series. That's sort of the, the series that really put them on the map, so to speak. Um, anyway, they uh, produced this video game called The Last of Us, uh, which was a major hit when it first came out. Uh, sort of received incredibly high critical reviews, uh, frequently cited as one of the greatest video games ever made. Um, it won a, a ton of Game of the Year awards that year and sold uh, over a million units, I think, in its first week. So extremely well-selling, extremely highly regarded critically, uh, just, just a very sort of well-known game. Uh, fought, the plot of the game follows this uh, character named Joel, this older uh, male figure named Joel, who is a uh, sort of a smuggler in this post-apocalyptic U.S. landscape. And Joel is tasked with escorting this sort of young teenage girl who obviously becomes a kind of surrogate daughter to him named Ellie across the United States. So the game is sort of broken up into uh, segments uh, that sort of follow the seasons and their journey across the United States. And this is all set against the backdrop of this, uh, again, this sort of post-apocalyptic setting, which was really popular in the early 2000s. There were a ton of, you know, post-apocalyptic films and things like that being made. Uh, but the, the sort of the, the background to that in the video game is that there are these, uh, cannibalistic creatures, uh, infected by a mutated fungus, um, that are, uh, that, that sort of took over humans. So it's, it's really, you know, a, a sort of a fancied up version, a different way of doing a zombie storyline. Um, but one of the things that I think made the game stand out is that it did it in a way that was very grounded. Usually when you have, you know, zombie video game type things, they're very heavy on the shoot 'em up aspect and very sort of aggressive and, uh, sort of over the top in a way. Uh, But The Last of Us took an incredibly grounded approach to that content and that material um, and really built the game around the characters of Joel and Ellie and the relationship that they forge uh, as sort of a surrogate father and and surrogate daughter. And the HBO series that uh, just came out 
uh, now a, a decade on, that's actually quite kind of interesting for me to say. I you know ten years ago I, I played the game when it came out. Now ten years later, it's it's being made as a uh, a, a TV series. Uh, really adapts the game almost one to one. Uh, it, it is a very faithful adaptation, really a sort of a religiously faithful adaptation to the the video game. And uh, it's it's gotten really high critical reviews. It's it broke records at HBO. Um, I, I think we were talking earlier and you'd said something like the, the finale of the first season was the most watched uh, episode since the finale of Game of Thrones or something like that for the network. So it's it's an overwhelming success for the network. It's uh, really a big hit with critics. Um, so it's it's sort of like it's it's hard to lose <laughs> with with The Last of Us. And that's a, a general overview of the game and, and the the show. So speaking of the video game, you know, is this the kind of video game that? kids could play and when i say kids no you know, middle, <laughs> well, middle school and high school you know middle school and high school because a lot of middle, middle schoolers play um very interesting and and violent games and one thing i would like to say is that you know when we do cultural apologetics we have mainly concentrated on television and uh you know film sometimes books but Really, one of the biggest mediums out there that we have only done a few episodes of our almost 350 episodes on is video games. I mean, that's one of the biggest entertainment mediums worldwide. And I would assume that probably more people have played the game or know about the game than even probably have watched the HBO series as popular as it has been. Oh, absolutely. Um the way that I sort of frame the discussion about video games um, when I have those talks, uh, video games are the new Pulp Fiction. If you know anything about the history of Pulp Fiction, um, Pulp Fiction magazines, Pulp magazines were were a lot uh, of writers 100 years ago, 110 years ago, uh, really started, uh, got, got their start in terms of what they were publishing. They were kind of... Uh, uh, Genre fiction, they really sort of gave rise to genre fiction. This is what birthed the likes of Robert E. Howard, who created Conan, um, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, Upton Sinclair even got his start writing in the pulps. But the pulp magazines were always sort of looked down upon by the higher you know, powers that be in literary circles. They were considered not really uh, good literature. But of course, the pulps uh, are where you know, classic American works like Shane by Jack Schaefer, which I, I require my college students to read. Um, Shane came, came out of the pulps. So uh, there's sort of been in, in later years a reevaluating of pulp fiction and the realization that, wait a minute, there were actually some really fantastic writers um, who were just writing short stories in pulp fiction magazines. Some of the most iconic characters um, uh, of the 20th century come out of pulp magazines. And video games sort of fill that modern niche. They're the things that a lot of people play. They're extremely popular among, you know, the, the average everyday people of the world. Um, same as the pulps were back in the day. Um, but they were, they're always sort of looked down upon among, uh, you know, literary circles and higher critics and things like that who think, well, nothing good can come out of them. It's uh, games like The Last of Us that have really contributed to the shifting critical evaluations of the medium and the stories that the medium tells uh, just in, in recent years. I've seen just in the past decade uh, a major kind of reevaluation being undergone uh, in literary circles and those kinds of discussions on the value and credibility of video games. And it's, it, it, it's probably worth saying that The Last of Us is always at the forefront of those conversations. It's one of those that always sort of come up in those discussions. Uh, now, as to your question of whether or not this is a video game for kids, no. And one of the things that parents um, should be aware of, and I think many of them aren't, um, mine certainly didn't pay as much attention to it as they should have, but there is a rating system for video games in the same way that there is a rating system for uh, uh, movies and, and television series, you know, TV 14, TVMA, PG 13, R, things like that. Uh, 
this The Last of Us would be a video game that sits firmly in the R rating for the video game world, which is rated M for mature, mature audiences only. Um, put it to you this way. Uh, I know that everything now is sort of digital. People buy video games digitally, even though parents should know you actually can set up parental locks on your kid's system, their video game system, so that they can't just buy whatever they want. Um, but uh, it, in like GameStop, which is where I would go and pick up these games, you know, 10 years ago, it's where I would shop. Uh, if you were, you know, too young or, or you didn't look, you know, sort of old enough to have graduated high school and you tried to purchase a mature rated game, they wouldn't sell it to you. You had to have a parent come in. Same as like trying to buy a ticket uh, to a rated R film. Um, there is a kind of rating system there that I have found is largely ignored among parents, probably because there's the the stigma of it's, oh, it's just a video game. How bad can it be? Um, video games are extremely sophisticated nowadays. Uh, this is this is not the same as Pac-Man in 1980. Uh, these are very mature, very uh, sort of thoughtful and nuanced uh, adaptations and and stories being told. Uh, through the video game medium. So I, I certainly think that uh, parents need to understand this is not a game for children. Um, I sort of even wonder if, um, uh, you know, uh, high schoolers could really grasp the story. I think I I played through this going into college and I would say that even then I sort of didn't grasp all the nuances um, that was that was in this particular game. It's a game that I've played in the years since and sort of have discovered more subtleties and layers and nuances to, especially the relationship between Joel and Ellie. Um, it's, it's a game that uh, really the, the rating for mature audiences only is, is warranted. So uh, I definitely think that's something parents should should be aware of going into this. And I think, you know, the television series is an accurate reflection of that. This is not a show for kids either. Um, it is TV, TVMA. It is HBO, which, you know, <laughs> it's HBO. Who are kids watching HBO? Um, but it, it's, it's, it's religiously faithful to the video game, even in the degree of adapting the more mature content. I did watch this series, and I would say that it is definitely a hard R, not for uh, graphic sexuality, but for very graphic violence and also language, for sure. And just so people know, there is uh, some queer themes that are explored in the first series, um, first season, rather, and after I watched it, I, you know, I don't video game at all, and uh, I haven't played any of these kinds of video games. And so I was wondering, well, how's the video game like this series? And I went and watched the intro and then the finale of the video game, and I was so surprised that um, there were lines of dialogue that were beat for beat exactly the same in the HBO series as the video game. And so while I didn't play the video game, it seems to me that it's been a pretty faithful adaptation. And so as if Christians are going to watch this show or um, also just to, they should know about it really because it's become this phenomenon, uh, like we said, the power of video games worldwide, really, people have played this game what should they be aware of when watching the show? Because I know some friends who had started watching it and then couldn't watch it past uh, like the third episode. They just quit. And then also you talked about it, the rating being mature, but sometimes we've said, well, like in the case of the whale, you know, really good conversations with your child. If you had an older teenager that was like a junior or senior in high school, they could watch the film. But what would you say about this series? So could older teenagers, you know, if their parents know more about it, can they play the video game and or watch this series? Yeah, I, I certainly think they, they could. Um, I would still, you know, caution, uh, caution uh, heavily. And really, I say that because the relationship that is central to the series and the video game both is that of, of Joel and Ellie. And um, what that relationship looks like, so Joel is played by Pedro Pascal in the series and voiced by Troy Baker in the video game. 
Uh, Joel is a uh, the, the character that the game sort of begins with, who has a daughter during the outbreak of this um, this cordyceps virus, uh, this fungal infection that's is sort of causing the collapse of society. Um, I won't spoil too many details. It's sort of telegraphed very early on. And if you know anything about the story, you sort of know this already, but uh, Joel's daughter is, is killed in sort of very dramatic and um, surprising fashion uh, very early on in the story. And so the rest of the storyline um, is really Joel uh, sort of being broken open and brought out of his shell uh, to become a father figure uh, to this girl uh, who is in desperate need of someone. Um, and of course, it's slowly revealed that she, this character, Ellie, is is actually more important than anyone could have ever known or imagined to the world of this uh, the, the story. Um, so there's a, a sense in which Joel becomes the, um, the protector of a, a potential Christ, in a way, a potential um, savior for mankind, um, which is what makes his choice at the end, which we can talk about so, so fascinating and why it's such a, a, a really interesting um, way to take this particular narrative. But And it's also what makes it so memorable. But um, with regards to what Christians should be aware of, so this is, this is interesting because I actually think the video game is more tame on some of these themes than the television series, and I'll unpack what I mean by that. When I played the video game, and I know that you and I had multiple conversations about this because you were watching the series and before I did, and we were sort of texting back and forth about this. Was this in the game? Was it not? Um, there are, in the video game, some subtle hints about certain characters in terms of uh, uh, LGBT stuff, uh, queer, queer themes, that kind of a thing. And um, it, it is stuff that, in the video game at least, is, is so, let's say, subtextual that unless you're really paying attention and really reading between the lines, we'll fly right past you. Um, there are some later themes that are brought out uh, with the character of Ellie uh, that sort of develop her as a, as a lesbian character. Um, those themes in the series uh, are present in later video games. There's two, uh, technically three video games, I guess, if you count the, uh, the DLC, uh, three of those video games. Those facets of Ellie's character are only brought out in the later video games. Uh, but they're sort of um, gone back and put into the first season of the show. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I remember when I first um, sort of learned that Ellie's character was supposed to be a lesbian, I was very shocked. Um, I still sort of remember seeing that and thinking, man, that's kind of out of left field because I had played the game and never, never read her character that way. Um, but in the show, it's sort of teased very early on and, and you get a whole episode that develops it. Um, and so it, it really puts that front and center. And of course, the episode that I think is probably the um, the big one for this conversation is is the character of, of Bill, who is played by, uh, in, the, in the series, Nick Offerman, um, is voiced in the video game by a wonderful character actor named W. Earl Brown. Uh, this character in the video game it's, is very sort of, again, subtextual that he had this sort of romantic relationship with a partner for years during the, the outbreak who left him. Well, that is, that is one of the things about the, the series that was changed. Um, rather than meeting Bill you know, after this uh, partner sort of left him, in the series you basically get an entire episode focused on Bill's backstory, um, which paints a very different picture than the video game uh, in terms of his relationship with this other man. And so those things are really brought out in much stronger colors in the television series than they were in the video game. Um, so in, in that respect, I actually think the video game is a little more tame than the show, um, which is sort of, sort of interesting. Usually it's uh, the other way around. But those themes are certainly there. Um, they're certainly there in the later games of the Last of Us series. I don't 
really think they're in there as, as strongly as in, in the first one. Uh, but they're definitely in the, the television series and, and people do need to be aware of that, especially, uh, uh, Christians and Christian parents who might be considering, you know, showing this to their kids or just even watching it themselves. Um, those themes are in there, uh, and, and, uh, they, they need to be aware of that. Here's what's coming up in future episodes of the Postmodern Realities podcast. If you follow theological topics on social media, you will recall there was a big kerfuffle about a book that was released last month called Beautiful Union by Pastor Josh Butler. We will be reviewing that book and have two articles related to that with my guests, Elisa Ruddell and Ann Kennedy. We also are going to cover this summer the entire Indiana Jones film series. And Phil Talon will be back for episode 350, and he will be talking about exorcism films. So those are some of the things that you can look forward to on the Postmodern Realities podcast. And we want you to get the word out. Please help us tell other people about our podcast. Simply tell a friend. That's the best way. But also sharing any of your favorite episodes on social media will be great. And there's so many that are related to recent episodes that we even had. If you listen to last week's episode on SatanCon, you know that John Ferrer talked all about that. And we even had an episode that John and I talked about the documentary Hail Satan that was about the Satanic Temple. So there's so much great content that we've had over the years. And if you're a new listener, you might want to go discover that at our website, equip.org. Now, the biggest thing you can do to help us out is help us out with the algorithm. And you can do that by leaving us a review or a five star, just hit the button there. We hope you think it's worth five stars on Apple Podcasts, but what really help us is let other people know in a short sentence why you listen to this podcast. If you could do that, we would be very grateful. And if you would do that on Apple Podcasts, that's the best way where people can see reviews about it. So thank you for your support. And also we would be grateful to help you bring this podcast every week we would be grateful for tips. And you can easily tip us if you head on over to our website, equip.org, hit journal, Postmodern Realities Podcast. There's a link to give us a tip. Maybe skip a couple of your favorite lattes for the week and give us a tip of 5 or $10 or even $20. We'd be very grateful. And now back to our interview about the HBO TV series, The Last of Us with Cole Burgett. So I want to talk about the actual TV series itself. So why don't you give, you've mentioned it just briefly, and I don't know if people really fully understood what you were talking about, you know, in terms of what started this apocalypse, and now they're living in this post-apocalyptic world. But can you give an overview of the very beginning of how they got to this um, place with zombies? There's this plague, and it has ravaged the entire world basically in a few days. And so how is this different than, you know, the normal zombie trope, I guess, especially when we're thinking of, you know, the, you know, Walking Dead, which was a very popular series. And there's been other ones since then that have kind of capitalized on this whole zombie kind of theme. So what makes this one different. Yeah, you you often see the sort of uh, the Living Dead trope, the uh, Night of the Living Dead, and, and and those those sorts of zombie tropes frequently used. You see it with the Walking Dead and things like that, um, in which you, you know it, it's basically just these sort of mindless uh, humans undead humans with sort of a craving for human flesh. Well, uh, in The Last of Us, they, they actually try to, to ground this in some kind of science. Um, the idea is that there is a mutated strain of a cordyceps fungus, which is a fungus that uh, affects, uh, in my understanding, insects like ants. Um, and this mutated strain begins to spread through the United States. Uh, now, I, I, I know there's some conversation in the television series about where it originated and how it originated. I'm not 100% certain if um, the dialogue in the series is supposed to be taken as gospel, because in the lore of the video game, 
this is a virus that began in, uh, or the fungus, I guess, that originated uh, from South America that was carried into humans through infected crops. It's, it's like that in the TV series as well. Yeah, I, I know there was some discussion about uh, things like flour and cereal and things like that, which right. uh, and, and, and pancake mix, which I thought was ironic because that was a very subtle way of explaining why Joel wasn't infected. Because if you remember the very first episode, he hates pancakes. I thought that was kind of interesting. He didn't eat that kind of food. And, and I thought that was a, a really clever, subtle way of, of tying that together. But anyway, um, something like 60% of humanity is either killed or infected by the fungus, which is uh, later referred to in the game as the cordyceps brain infection. Um, and then, of course, the rest of humanity is sort of, of dying off. And what happens with this virus and where this is sort of different from zombies is uh, the cordyceps virus, uh, it, it's, it sort of turns humans into a, a larger part of a sort of a kind of mycelial network or something like that, um, where it's sort of a, a hive mind, it's sort of connected. Um, the fungus eventually will kill the host that it attaches to, and the host's body will then sort of grow these fungal projections. Um which release these infectious spores. So there are scenes in the video game, um, which really weren't dealt with a ton in the, in the TV series, but in the video game it's there where um, characters are often wearing masks. They have to wear masks to protect themselves from these airborne uh, spores. Um, and that's, that's really prominent in, in the video game. It's not so much prominent in the, uh, the series. Uh, but that's that's really uh, what it is, and and what's interesting um, is that it's if you're if you're familiar at all with just zombie tropes and the zombie genre, um, and I'm I'm not an expert on that by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I've seen a bunch of the movies, and you know they are what they are. But um, it, the the real difference is in sort of a grounding of a fungus, uh, this infection in a sort of a real world explanation. Um, that is is far more uh again it's 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 fungus based which i know doesn't really it might just seem odd uh or like well who cares well it, it's really sort of different in terms of the genre it's just a really sort of original idea um you're not just sort of being chased around by these mindless humans but people who have really sort of been taken over and mutated um and that sort of forms some of that good uh, drama in the series. If you remember uh, the one episode where uh, Ellie and Joel meet Henry and he has the, the younger brother who sort of asked the question, uh, if, if you're bitten and you're infected and you mutate, is it still you inside? Um, or is it just this, this whole new thing? So it gets into some interesting, uh, moral and ethical questions in that way that, you know, simply saying, well, you know, they're, they're undead doesn't really take you into that territory. But I think if any of our listeners want to be, I guess, disturbed <laughs> as to how this is really based on real life, I would just point them to, um, you can go onto YouTube and National Geographic has like a four minute video and it's literally called zombie parasite cordyceps fungus nice takes over insects through mind control and this yeah. was a video posted four years ago so uh way before the hbo series debuted so if you're wanting to just google that you can get it i think the inspiration um for Druckmann and, and straley the straley the, the original director of the video game and, and Druckmann was the writer and and, and uh the creative director I think the inspiration came, they said they were watching sort of a documentary, um, History Channel or National Geographic, something like that. And uh, the documentary sort of mentioned this, uh, this fungal virus sort of thing that takes over insects. And I think they were sort of watching it and said, oh, that, that's, an, that's an interesting idea. We've never seen that before. <laughs> Let's do that. So it just goes to show you how uh, uh, the creative minds work. So... I just want to remind our listeners, like I said at the beginning of this episode, this is going to be spoiler filled. So we're just going to talk about the characters and what happened in terms of plot. So if that is something you don't want to hear, you might want to turn it off and come back to listen after you've watched the series. But as you mentioned, there are two main characters and 
older man, Joel, who used to have a daughter who dies at the very first episode, and then a young girl, Ellie. So can you talk about these characters and then give us kind of an overview of their arc in the game and in the show, because it's so similar. Yeah, so uh, Joel, as introduced, um, the character who loses his daughter very early on in this story um, and is uh, sort of becomes a, a smuggler in this post-apocalyptic world, just doing what he can to survive, uh, becomes this sort of protector uh, entrusted with uh, this Ellie girl who becomes, who at first just seems like cargo, right? That's sort of one of the recurring themes very early on in the series. You know, what is she? Who is she? Uh, she's just cargo. She's a job that he's getting paid for to deliver her where she needs to go. Um, but as it sort of goes on, you, you it's sort of revealed that Ellie is actually immune. Um, she's actually been bitten. Um, she has been infected but she has not changed. She has not been taken over by the fungus. So there's something about her uh, that makes her immune to this fungal infection. And so the realization sort of uh, dawns on Joel that he uh, he's essentially got in his care, has been entrusted with the care of what might be the only known cure uh, for this this infection. And um, there's a there's a real sense in which Joel grows into the role of the father that he never had the chance to be uh, to this uh, girl, who again is sort of a Christ figure in in the story of of this world. Uh, she's sort of the only hope for for mankind. Now, what makes these characters so interesting and this story so memorable? And I, I think you even uh, messaged me when you watched the final episode. It's like, what? Why does Joel make this choice? Joel gets Ellie where she's going, and this is the the spoiler filled sort of interview here. Um, but Joel gets Ellie where she's going, and then it's revealed, um, sort of in very fast and unexpected fashion, that she's being taken in and and prepped for surgery uh, because the fungus affects the brain and in order to uh, sort of extract the stuff that's going to produce a cure for the human race, Ellie's going to have to, ascend, to have to die. Um, she's going to have to be killed in order to uh, extract the, the stuff, so to speak, the antibodies that's going to cure humanity. And when Joel learns this, um, he he says, I'm basically, I'm not going to go through this again. I lost one daughter. I've come to think of this girl as my daughter and I'm not going to let this happen. And so he sort of <laughs> murders everyone <laughs> is a, is a way of saying, but that's what happens. Uh, he, he sort of goes on a, a rampage, um, to get this girl back. And in doing so, he sort of consciously makes the choice to condemn humanity, to, to condemn the human race to this terrible fate um, to protect this girl um, that he's come to think of as a daughter. And what makes that such a really just a clever way to tell that story and a memorable way to tell that story is because we are sort of, um, we've sort of been weaned as people people who love stories and who, who go to, to, to see stories told, we've sort of been weaned on this idea of what Star Trek calls, you know, the needs of the many. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And someone always has to make a sacrifice um, in order to save, you know, everyone else. And this is a story where uh, Joel looks at this and says, I'm unwilling to make that sacrifice. I will not make that sacrifice again. Uh, forget the needs of the many. And he rescues this girl. Um, and so the story really sort of ends with Joel, um, in essence, lying to her. He makes up this whole story as to why it didn't work, as to why it couldn't it couldn't be done. And he tells Ellie all of this and sort of sells her on this idea that there is no cure. It was all sort of a, a mistake. And he commits to it. He commits hard to this narrative um, and lying to her. And so it's, uh, it's an it's an incredibly memorable story uh, really for that, for that reason um, because it puts the player and I would argue even the viewer in the television series in a really um, 
sort of interesting position. More so the gamer as you're playing through it because it's interactive, right? It's inviting you as the player to participate in the world where you're you're sort of playing this and you think, um, you know, in, if I were in his shoes, could I make that kind of choice? And this is where I say, uh, I don't think a really a younger video gamer who's a teenager will really appreciate the the situation that Joel is in or even the choice that he makes at the end of the game. Um, unless, you know, that person has got some miles on them as Joel has. And if that person is uh, a father uh, or some kind of father figure to someone, you know, that the choice that he makes is, is really something that's only going to resonate with really just a, a select few in the population. And there's really sort of a boldness to that kind of storytelling decision that really makes the game stand out and, and really in a sense heightens the narrative for it. It's a very sort of poignant ending um, that really leaves a lot of room for debate. So that's really the arc that Joel undergoes. Um, and Ellie's arc is, you know, growing to open up to Joel and respond to him and accept him as a father figure and putting, uh, coming, coming to trust him as, uh, uh, as a father when she, you know, has several lines to him about how everyone she's ever sort of put that kind of trust in has, has left her walked away and trusting that Joel won't do that. Um, she, she gets sort of what she wants out of him as a father, but of course it, it comes at the cost of being fed the greatest lie <laughs> he possibly could. And really you know, the selfishness of that choice is not giving her the opportunity to make a choice is not giving her the opportunity to choose and make the choice for her. And that ultimately sets up the conflict that comes between them in uh, later video games. Um, but you know, th those later video games when the story w was being told were not guaranteed. Uh, th there's a very real sense in which, you know, the last of us could stand alone. In fact, I was sort of, and still am sort of apprehensive and against there being a sequel to this story because I think it's so well done and, and told so well in its in its original state. But uh, the series follows the video game very faithfully, so the the character arcs are the same there. That that's really the core of of what the story is about. You were just talking about some things that Joel had to do in terms of not wanting to lose Ellie, and this is a very uh, dark story. I mean, there's a lot of harrowing situations that they are in throughout the series. So what are some of the moral and ethical dilemmas that they face, that they have to make these choices? And and because of that, you were noting that definitely not even a middle school kid, but even a teenager, could they really appreciate or not appreciate or just understand what's going on in some of these very uh, dark situations that is even facing Ellie, and she's very young. It's not like she's an older teenager. She's a very young kid and having to make these excruciating decisions. It, it's This is sort of the stuff where you will lose uh, younger viewers, younger you know game players, that sort of thing. Uh, the, the, I mean, it's all throughout the series. Um, and it, it's not just Joel and Ellie who face these moral dilemmas and ethical dilemmas. It's sort of something that every character faces. And that's, that's part of what makes the story so interesting and, and memorable is that the, all of these characters sort of face this stuff. Um, the character of Tess, especially, um, who is played in the video game, voiced in the video game by, by Annie Wershing, who, you know, recently passed, um, wonderful sort of actress kind of, kind of passed unexpectedly, but, um, uh, played in the TV series by Anna Torv. If anyone remembers uh, Fringe, uh, she she was the main character in Fringe, another very good actress. She plays Tess in this series, and Tess has the um, has to make the decision very early on when she's infected, but she realizes what Ellie is, um, or who Ellie is, and or what she represents. And Joel isn't convinced. Um, very early on, Joel thinks that there's, you know, there's something wrong with her, that, that there's no way that she could possibly be a cure, but it's really Tess, um, and uh, who, who comes to believe in Ellie sort of, you know, blindly and, uh, take, takes it on blind faith, um, and sacrifices herself, but in doing so makes Joel promise, um, that the, the, her sort of dying wish in a sense is that Joel gets Ellie where she's supposed to go. Um, 
and being faced with that sort of uh, decision of of do you do you give up and go home and write this off or do you do you see it through no matter what? Um, that's sort of the early decision that Joel faces. And these decisions come up time and time again. I mean, it's a decision that Bill faces in his episode with his partner, um, how they're supposed to, you know, how they're going to die in essence, uh, how to, how to make it a, a painless death. Um, you see this in the episode with Henry, which is really, even in the game is a very affecting, um, a very affecting, uh, storyline and is is just as affecting in the in the TV series um and that that's sort of the one storyline outside of just the uh, the queer storylines that I would really caution parents toward um there's a a scene a particular storyline and, and particular scene that features uh, a sort of a very young child um becoming infected and it's done in sort of very unexpected and um, shocking fashion. And his older brother who is sort of loved and cared for him has to make a, a, a decision that he literally cannot live with. And so it, it, it really is like a, uh, if you're not, if you don't know it's coming, if you haven't played the video game and know that the story is coming, I can see how that particular storyline would end on a, on an absolutely gut wrenching and shocking note to the to point that I would say that it probably could really disturb um, older teenagers, especially if they have younger siblings, um, seeing something like that. So it, it's definitely not a show for the faint-hearted, um, but it, it really raises uh, those questions of moral and ethical dilemmas. Um, and of course, Joel and Ellie sort of witnessing the cost. What does it cost them? And these other people that they've met and come into contact with to get as as far as they uh, need to be, um, and, and so there's a there's a sense in which they've gone through so much together that they they have to press on, they have to get where they're going because otherwise, you know, what what was all of this worth? Why did we go through any of this in the first place? Why did we watch all of these, you know, potential friends and allies ultimately die and you know? kill themselves and each other? Why did they go through all of this if not to, to see the journey through to the end? Um, and then of course there's the episode where Joel reconnects with his brother, which is a really wonderfully acted episode. It's actually one of the tamer episodes of the show. There's not really a ton of action that goes on there, but it's really wonderfully acted between the, the cast members involved um, where Joel really looks at his life and sees pretty much everything as being a failure um, and he really comes to doubt his ability to get Ellie where she needs to go. And he tries to sort of pawn her off on his brother. And, and of course he can't get away with it, but, um, it was really wonderfully acted, really, uh, good emotional dialogue and, and, and writing there. So, uh, the whole show is, and, and the whole video game is, you know, moral and ethical dilemmas that these characters face and not just the main characters, but the side characters as well. And arguably it's the, uh, it's the side characters who make these really hard choices that are the most memorable and affecting. I think it would be very easy to characterize The Last of Us as a television series about zombies in a post-apocalyptic world, a la The Walking Dead, if anyone's seen that TV series. But that's not really what the show is about or its focus. And yes, there are gruesome uh, fungus zombies, but I was surprised that they are not present in every episode or were not really a focus of the series. That did surprise me. Now, I know there are more zombies in the actual video game, and that's just for gameplay, but the stories in The Last of Us are very intimate and personal stories between the characters. I mean, even in the supporting characters, there's one episode devoted entirely to the backstory of a supporting character in the video game. And they've expanded that for the TV series. And I think that the stories are very intimate, particularly between Joel and his surrogate daughter, Ellie. So why do you think that this story has resonated with so many people? I mean, The Last of Us is getting high praise and high critical praise, both from fans and from critics, regardless of its medium, whether it's 
television in the HBO series or the video game itself? I think the story has really resonated with people, um, really because, as you were pointing out, at its core, it's a story about family. Um, and how that sort of is is built, in a sense, from the rubble, from the ashes of, of this collapsed society. Uh, there's nothing um, really normal or standard anymore. There's no, you know, normal ways of, of building a family, of meeting people and building a family in, in the old-fashioned sense. I mean, people are very scared and skeptical of one another. Um, and that's really sort of part of the tension of the show is you never really know who you can trust or what their motivations are. And yet you still see these characters who try to build the equivalent of a, a nuclear family all throughout the series. You have Joel who is uh, trying to connect with Ellie, become a surrogate father to her. Uh, you see this with uh, his brother Tommy as well. Um, who is sort of married and trying to start a family and, and have a child and, and all of this. Um, this is even sort of what uh, underlies uh, Bill's storyline, is trying to find uh, a partner um, in, the, in the midst of uh, you know, you know, this, this collapsed society. And, uh, you know, Christians really do need to be aware of the fact that this is, is really heavily played up uh, in the series and really sort of treated as kind of a completely normal sort of thing. Um, there's no uh, real exploration or excavation of the uh, morality of it or anything like that. Um you know that that being said i think these uh these storylines resonate with people because they're ultimately stories about about family about fathers and daughters about um mothers and daughters you see that with the final episode in the television series especially where the um voice actress for Ellie actually plays Ellie's mother in the the series and um, there's a, a real sort of connection there with, with her daughter and, and uh, sort of making the ultimate sacrifice to ensure her daughter's safety, that sort of thing. So the, 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 the heart of the story is really a, a story about family and trying to make sense of that and make it make sense in a world where literally everything has changed about life. Um, and, the, and the way life is lived in a society that doesn't exist anymore. So uh, that's part of what I think causes The Last of Us to resonate with people is simply the, um, the nature of the storytelling being uh, so thematically grounded um, in this, this idea of family. Christianity is talked about in several episodes of this series, and in particular, it's featured quite prominently in one very dark episode towards the end of the season. So there has been some online commentary about this. Now, do you think that this show is critical of religion and critical of Christianity in particular? Yeah, Christianity is talked about uh, several episodes in this series and features you know really prominently in one particular episode late in the season uh, whether this is a show that is critical of religion of is critical of christianity in particular um i certainly think um people will read it that way especially some of the comments that are made regarding people of faith you know some of the questions asked are why do you still you know believe in anything anymore you know what what does this really give you in a, a world where, you know, clearly everything has gone wrong. Um, but I think that would really sort of be a, a mischaracterization of what the show is, is sort of interested in. And I'll tell you, I, I really only get there um, having played other games that Neil Druckmann, the, the writer of the, the, the original video game and, and you know, the, the co-creator of this television series, 
um, other games that he has made. Uh, in in his video games, especially uh, the fourth Uncharted game, which he he uh, directed and and, and wrote, uh, this that storyline leans heavily into um, Christian ideas and themes. In fact, the the story, if you know anything about Uncharted, it's a, it's a series that's sort of like Indiana Jones meets John McClane from the Die Hard series. Uh, but it's sort of an adventuring, you know, modern day globe trotting adventure type thing, looking for artifacts and that sort of thing. Um, but the 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 hook of the fourth game, uh, the sort of the artifact that is the, the MacGuffin that's driving the story, revolves around um, this uh, cross of Saint Dismas, which is like you know deep sort of Catholic lore. If you know anything about uh, that character, St. Dismas, was the penitent thief um, that was supposedly on the cross uh, next to Jesus, um, not the, the thief who, you know, had no regard for Jesus, who denied him, but the thief who, you know, cried out to him, um, the, the penitent thief, sort of revolves around that. So there's a, a really clear sort of indicator that Druckmann, at least in his uh, stories, is sort of interested in exploring these themes and ideas. He's really sort of interested in uh, not really, you know, discussing faith in a really sort of overt sense, but he really sort of pulls on themes and ideas from the Christian tradition to inform some of his storytelling. And I've, I've always sort of wondered where that comes from. I don't really know if he has a a history with Christianity. I don't know if he has a history with Catholicism, especially. I, I don't know. But there's clearly some kind of interest there. He's pulling this stuff from somewhere. Um, and the character of David in this show, uh, in this particular late season episode, is presented as a, a man of faith. Um, and he's he's really sort of presented as a, as a corrupt man of faith who has come to use his uh, the, the, uh, the, in a sense, the faith that his people, his followers have put in him to really deceive them. Um, which is not the same as saying that, uh, you know, Christianity is deceiving them. That's, that's not at all what the, uh, ass assertion is. Um, but there is a, a real sense in which, um, there's a character who comes in and takes advantage of, uh, a very, you know, enfeebled people's faith in a Messiah, in um, in, in Christ, and sort of uh, turns that against them, uses that uh, really to his own ends. And there's a sense in which he, he's sort of shown to do it out of desperation. Um, you know, the twist in the episode is that he's they're, they're cannibals, but most of these people don't know it. That what he's been doing is feeding these people people. And he's been doing this um, because there's no other, according to him, there's no other way of doing it. This is this is how I keep them alive. They've put their trust in me to lead them, and I know no other way to do this. I had to make this choice. Um, and he's sort of rationalizing, you know, the monster that he's become using um, the the these Christian people who put their faith in him as an excuse to do it. Um, but that's not the the same as you know putting. Uh, becoming critical of, of Christianity uh, in in general, and you sort of have to pay care, careful and close attention to that. Um, that being said, I mean, is this a show that is um, certainly um, anti certain biblical ideas? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you really have several episodes that uh, sort of embrace, uh, you know queer storylines and, and queer characters and that sort of thing, and, and really in, in sort of um, profound ways that other shows have not even dared. Um, and you really have to watch carefully and, and separate those things out. Um, but I, I don't think this is a show that is, uh, as I said, some some in some way, shape, or form uh, anti Christian. It's not going after religion. It's not going after Christianity. But those, there are themes and ideas pulled from Christianity that are certainly informing the storytelling, and, and that's really seems to be Druckmann's mo, honestly. And I've I've always sort of wondered where that comes from.
I'd like for you to talk about some of the supporting characters in the series. I think all of them are memorable in their own ways. Now, were all of these characters in the video games? One of the ones that we mentioned earlier in the podcast is a character named Bill, and they actually build an entire episode around him. It does have a queer theme, which is not graphic in any way or explicit. And it is this kind of side character who's kind of mentioned, but they build this whole story of his life and how the apocalypse has caused him to find love. And I also want to know if this adaptation is faithful to various different supporting characters. Now they've added some characters. I want to ask you about when they added named Kathleen, because one of the memorable characters, supporting characters is this character named Henry and his, he takes care of his brother. And there are other characters that actually are played by the same actress in both the HBO series and as a voice actor in The Last of Us. And that's the character of Marlene. And she's the head of a resistance movement called the Fireflies. Although it's hard to find good guys in this, in this series. It seems like everybody, even the resistance are, are bad guys. So why don't you talk about some of the various different characters that are in the series? The supporting characters in The Last of Us really make the show in a lot of ways. In some ways, they're more memorable than the, the main characters. The character of Tess, especially, uh, played by Anna Tour, I think we already mentioned her, um, is really sort of well-known, played by Annie Wershing in the uh, uh, video game. Um, character of Bill, um, you know, Nick Offerman will have his own portrayal of the character, and it's, it's really, in a way, sort of different from the a uh, character played by W. Earl Brown in the video game. Um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, Bill from the video game sort of sticks with me more than um, the TV series. Um, which I think is interesting. Uh, then, of course, the character of, of Henry from later in the, the series, uh, who who has to, you know, Joel and Ellie meet, and they ha- he has to make the, the choice regarding his brother. Um it's really sort of a, a gut wrenching episode to watch, but um, uh, the, the 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 supporting characters in the series are really well written, and it's not just that way for the television series. The television series expands on some of those characters and their stories, but the um, the the core uh, narrative, let's say, with the exception of, of really Bill, Bill's story really changes from the. Um, video game to the series, and I've I've always sort of wondered why they did that because Bill was a very memorable character in his own right. Uh, you know, maybe you can, if you're cynical enough, you say, well, they did it to just push a a sort of uh, queer storyline, force it in there. Um, but there were you know traces, I think, in the video game, some subtextual stuff there, uh, maybe some comments made off to the side about. Um, Bill having a partner and, and things like that. I really don't remember that too strongly, but I remember the character of Bill well. Um, that's probably due to the fact that I really like W. Earl Brown. Um, he's a very good character actor. But um, the supporting characters in a lot of ways can steal the show. Um, Marlene uh, is sort of a, a really interesting villain insofar as there is a villain in the show, sort of an over an overarching villain, um, you know, in, in, a, in some ways the villain of the series becomes Joel, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and Marlene is the character that he sort of goes up against, um, who is, is an antagonist because she opposes the protagonist, but really has sort of selfless m- motivations in that. Um, she's willing to sacrifice Ellie for the greater good of humanity, whereas Joel isn't. And uh, the, again, that just makes for some really compelling and interesting viewing and storytelling because it, it um, there's a sense in which the, the Last of Us takes the road less traveled when it comes to how it uh, wraps up its narrative. Now, I think we mentioned earlier that there are more video games. There's The story continues. And uh, I'll be honest, I was nowhere near as interested in the Last of Us Part Two, or even in the DLC, um, than I was that that first game, uh, simply because uh, the the first game ends on such a uh, 
interesting, profound, um, and nuanced, nebulous sort of note um, where Joel really sells this lie to Ellie um, and then having to sort of live with himself in the aftermath of that. And I think that's ex- extremely interesting. It's an extremely interesting way to tell this story. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the side characters certainly make um, the whole thing more memorable. You remember much more with The Last of Us than just the ending. And the way the characters are adapted in the television series are pretty faithful to their video game incarnations. So it's uh, it, it certainly makes for memorable viewing all around. Uh, and then in the television series, there is a character named Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen is an original character to the series. She was not in the video game. Um, more or less uh, really just created to give a, a face to some of the uh, the villains that the characters encounter, uh, which was, wasn't was really needed in the video game. The, the, really the story was about Henry there. Um, but in the television series, Kathleen takes on the role of this... Uh, sort of resistance leader uh, against the the government that really they sort of hold responsible for failing to prevent the outbreak. And so uh, Joel and Ellie and Henry and his brother Sam come into conflict with Kathleen uh, as a result of Henry being uh, a collaborator, having worked with uh, the government uh, and there's a within this resistance movement. There's a serious that's a, a serious no no. Uh, it's sort of looked at as a betrayal, um, and Kathleen sort of carries out, in essence, a, sort of like a death penalty for collaborators and that kind of a thing. Um, so she plays a particularly ruthless character, uh, takes on a very ruthless role as the leader of this sort of resistance group. Um, but she's sort of only there for one episode and really the role itself is, you know, sort of unnecessary. It was sort of created just to kind of humanize and give the actors, uh, someone to, to play off of rather than have just a bunch of faceless enemies, uh, you know, coming at them, which is, is what you have in the video game. I want to ask you about how this story The Last of Us compares with similar themes in the post-apocalyptic novel, The Road, which is a Pulitzer Prize-winning novel by Cormac McCarthy. It was also made into a film. And for newer listeners, you might not know that we covered The Road back in episode 135. Our episode was called Questing for Divine Love in Cormac McCarthy's The Road. And you can listen to it on our website, equip.org. But... In that particular novel, the road ends on a much hopeful note, it seems to me, when I read it. And also it has similar beats to it. There is a father and son, which is the central relationship in the road. And similarly, there is a surrogate father and his daughter in The Last of Us and Joel and Ellie. But it seems to me that The Last of Us is a little bit more bleak than the road, even though they both have cannibals and it's a post-apocalyptic scenario, it seems that there's less hope in The Last of Us, but there are reviewers that would argue that there's similarities to both of those stories, and there is hope in The Last of Us. Yeah, well, everything done um, since The Road came out, both the book and the the film adaptation with Viggo Mortensen, uh, has been influenced by The Road. I mean, it's one of the trope codifiers it's uh, it really became a hallmark of the genre fairly quickly. So there's really no scenario in which anything done in the post-apocalyptic genre since then isn't in some way, shape, or form influenced by the road. Uh, yes, there are some very obvious similarities and parallels. The idea of a, a sort of a surrogate father figure navigating through this world with a um, uh, a child. That might be the most uh, the most obvious parallel uh, regarding the place of hope in either stories. Um, I, I just think the stories that each of them are telling are really really quite different. Um, the Last of Us is is really a, just a story of, of fathers and daughters 
Um, and Joel's choice at the end, uh, though, though certainly selfish, is nevertheless um, a, a, a logical, in a way, choice. It's a very obvious sort of choice. Um, that's the sort of rich texture that The Last of Us allows for in the ending of its story, is what, what person in Joel's position uh, would really choose otherwise. Um, I, I sort of think that it's, um, it's really sort of wise in that way. Um, I, I don't even think that it's necessarily that cynical to suggest that you know, it, when faced with the same choice, what father would willingly allow uh, a son or a daughter, especially one so young, to be sacrificed, even if it means, you know, helping a whole bunch of other people that, frankly, he has never met, and he's seen the state of the world and the the shape the world is in. These people aren't even that great. <laughs> um, it's it's sort of uh, uh, interesting in that way, and I think what makes it so jarring to us, as I said before, is that we are sort of conditioned through stories um, to think of those kinds of dilemmas from the perspective of, uh, again, the, the Star Trek issue, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, is how that is often framed. Um, and so the the choice is always to go with the, the needs of the many. Uh, and so it's, it's actually sort of jarring to us when we have someone um, make a decision that says, you know, forget the needs of the many. Um, what about this one girl that <laughs> doesn't is not given a choice in the matter? Um, so it's uh, it's really sort of a compelling story in that way. And so I, I don't even necessarily think that um, there's it's an issue of hope. Where is there more hope? I, I think it's just an issue of of um, sort of disposition and outlook on the world. The road is certainly a bleak novel. Uh, but there is a, 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 a more, I think, a sense of optimism, more of a sense of optimism toward humanity and people than is in The Last of Us. Um, I think The Last of Us certainly uh, paints a world in which everyone is sort of um, compromised, maybe in some kind of irredeemable sort of way. Um, and, you know, there, there's certainly room for theological debate uh, on that. Do you think this series has set a new bar for video game adaptations to film or television in Hollywood? And as we were talking about earlier in the podcast, video games really is a worldwide medium that has many, probably hundreds of millions, if not maybe a billion or more people interacting with that medium. And it is today's books, I guess. More kids play video games than read books. A lot of adults play video games. There are even some grandparents I know on YouTube who are YouTubers that play video games, this 80-year-old grandma that does. And so it's a very big medium, so Christians should pay attention to it. Now, I want to ask you if this is a good start compared to what's come in the past because I know there have been some particular adaptations of video games that have not been good, in particular from this same studio that did The Last of Us, you mentioned earlier, Naughty Dog, and Neil Druckmann that we've been talking about. He's one of the co-presidents of Naughty Dog. And prior to The Last of Us, they had a very popular video game series called Uncharted. And I remember seeing that there was, I guess, a trailer for a film starring Tom Holland in the theaters called Uncharted. I think it was based on the video games. I mean, I thought the trailer looked pretty cheesy. It wasn't something I was interested in seeing um, this this film. But anyway, that is another series that was adapted from this video game studio, Naughty Dog. So what do you think about 
this adaptation and previous video game adaptations? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, The Last of Us, just the critical reviews for the television series make it very clear that uh, this is very likely the first video game adaptation um, that really does it right. And I think the secret sauce, if you will, is the fact that Druckmann, who wrote the original video game, who was intimately tied to the original video game, um, has also been intimately tied to the development of the television series. Um, and then, of course, they got Craig Mazin, who did Chernobyl, who has a, a great um, eye for this kind of storytelling, you know, pairing him with Neil Druckmann. It was just really well conceived um, in terms of how to bring this already very cinematic story um, in in the video game medium to life on on you know the big screen in, in a in a to use that expression. Um, so I, I think uh, having Druckmann on board, the guy who really knew what made the original story work so well, because he wrote it, he conceived it, um, and and bringing him in and letting him um, sort of have his way with the adaptation to screen. Uh, was was really the right move in terms of getting the most out of the adaptations. Most video game adaptations, um, they sort of just they stag what I call the 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 uh, the trailer shots. So the stuff from the video game trailers that you know really make people want to you know invest in the game. This is what they did with Uncharted, for example. The Uncharted film adaptation that came out last year was absolutely abysmal. Um, I never actually finished it. Uh, because I was so disappointed in it. I was a, an, a sort of an original Uncharted fan. And the um, you know, I, I played the video game when it came out back in 2007, have played them all since. And when the, the film came out, I, I tried watching it. I think I made it about 30 minutes in, and then I thought, this is just this is horrendous. It doesn't understand what made the games work. And from what I, I gathered watching you know trailers and other parts of the film and just what little bit I saw... Is that the the filmmakers and Druckmann was not involved in, in that uh, adaptation anywhere near as he was The Last of Us, but um, what the the filmmakers and screenwriters did is they sort of grabbed the parts, highlights as it were, the trailer moments from the video games of the Uncharted series and put them together, with no regard for the fact that the story and the themes that stitched those scenes together in the video game. Or what got people invested in it? The amazing characters, um, you know, Nathan Drake, voiced by Nolan North, really extremely well done. The themes, the nuances, the uh, struggles that Drake faced with growing as a character and letting go of this uh, sort of need to find uh, treasure and to find his value and his worth in you know the 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 treasures that he found, and really he you know the, he ultimately just found his value in being a thief. Um, those stories are all sacrificed on the altar of, we'll look at this really cool action sequence. Uh, we'll just throw Tom Holland in there and Mark Wahlberg in there, throw some big names on the screen and it works. No, it doesn't. It was, it was really a terrible disappointment because I was very fond of those games and I, I really hated what I saw of the adaptation to the point where I was very skeptical when they announced The Last of Us. Um, and then of course, uh, the critical reviews came out about The Last of Us and, you know, sort of held it as uh, the best video game adaptation, uh, among the best video game adaptations, if not the best video game adaptation. And uh, so I ended up watching it and thought, yeah, this is actually extremely faithful to the video game. It understands the story that the video game is telling. It understands the characters, most importantly. Um, and that, again, comes as a result of of Druckmann um, working on it, I think. So I do think it sets a, a new bar for video game adaptations in Hollywood. I certainly think it makes a case for involving the creators of the video games more in the development of uh, the adaptations. Um, you know, if, if something works in a video game medium, it might be a good idea to then, you know, bring those people in <laughs> who understand what made it work because they're the ones who put it together to sort of help develop the, uh, the adaptation of it. It just sort of makes a kind of logical sense there. Um, and it's my understanding that, uh, Druckmann was very meticulous in his negotiations, um, for the last of us adaptation, um, 
early, early on when he was negotiating contracts, it was my understanding that he was um, very meticulous in what he wanted um, to the point where he worked into contracts like specific plot points. Certain things had to happen, uh, the, it had to be done in a certain way in order for it to even be, um, in order for the rights to even be purchased to make the thing. So it was, it's very clearly a story that was near and dear to his heart. I sort of wish the uh, same affection would have been given to the Uncharted film. Um, I think that wasn't the case because that ultimately wasn't Druckmann's baby. Uncharted was created by a wonderful writer named Amy Hennig, um, who has really sort of revolutionized not just the video game industry, but the role of women in the video game industry, which is often a topic of conversation. Um, but she uh, she created Uncharted. That was really her sort of brainchild. And Druckmann sort of finished, wrapped off, wrapped up, wrapped up the series. He finished off the story after Hennig left Naughty Dog. Um, but th the reason I think Uncharted didn't didn't do so well is because none of those people were really involved in its creation. But The Last of Us, on the other hand, has done incredibly well. Um, and I think Christians should pay attention to this sort of thing, because if there is any indicator that um, this is going to sort of uh, become a, a new thing, these sort of adaptations, it is the success of The Last of Us, which is a video game that many people are familiar with, many people know, um, and you know, you know, it's a very good chance that many Christians, their children or their children's friends, have played this game or are playing this game because of the show. And now that the adaptation has become so successful, and not just this one, but the Super Mario Brothers film, which is now the highest grossing film of this year, an adaptation of video games, uh, I definitely think this is something that um, more studios, because you know, I mean, look, Hollywood's predictable. They're going to go where the money is, right? And they're just going to keep doing that over and over until people stop spending money on it. Um, video game adaptations are going to become more and more um, naturalized as we go forward. So if Christians want to keep their thumb on the pulse of the culture, on the pulse of what their children are watching, interacting with, the video games they're playing, yeah, this is something that they should probably pay attention to. So finally, on a much lighter note than the apocalypse and mushroom fungus zombies, I have a fun question for Cole. It's almost summer. So, Cole, what is the best vacation you have ever taken? Uh, best vacation I've ever taken. That's actually a very difficult <laughs> question for me to answer. I feel like you ask these simple questions that I, 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 I've really struggled to answer. Uh, the truth is I have not been on a, a true vacation in years. I'm, I'm talking, you know, um, over, over a decade, really. And I sort of keep telling myself, I'm going to, this is the year that I take a vacation. This is the year that I just go do something. Uh, and I never do because I always get too busy with other things. And I, I work, I, I, I'm a, I'm a workaholic. I'm one of those people who works way too much. Um, but I enjoy what I do, so I can't really complain. Um, I, I have been thinking about taking a vacation this year or maybe next year. And, you know, it's going to be somewhere, you know, it, it'll be somewhere sort of, predictable to a coast or something like that uh, because I think at, my, at heart I'm a bit of a beach bum but uh, I, I don't know it'll be somewhere warm and tropical you've been listening to episode 340 of the postmodern realities podcast today's guest was Cole Burgett he has written an in-depth tv series review of HBO's The Last of Us his review is called Finding Family Among the Last of Us and you can read it for free at our website equip.org Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there, as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And it's in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which 
Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You won't, don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube at, in your, with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. 